All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our wonderful Spark event this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about taxes. It is tax season. Um, feel free to type any questions you have in the live chat. We may not get to everything um, tonight, but we will do the best we can just in the short time frame because taxes are very complex. Um, but yeah, we're very excited to have you here with us. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jalen Vasquez. I'm the director of Freelancers Hub. Just a little bit about uh, what we do at Freelancers Hub. Uh, it's the Freelancers Union co-working space here in Brooklyn, New York. We offer free co-working and various workshops like this and many others uh, to help freelancers bring their business to the next level. Uh, this month's uh, Spark, we're going to be talking about taxes, as I mentioned. We'll be joined with Jonathan Meadows of Meadows CPA and CPA for Freelancers. He's no stranger to Spark. He's led this event many times for us before in the past. Uh, but before I invite Jonathan on, I'd like to invite our new Spark director, Ms. Veronica Chan, to tell you more of what Spark is about. Cool. How's it going, Veronica? Good. How are you? Um, Good. So, so some of you may be wondering, what is Spark? Spark is our nationwide monthly meetup event hosted by Freelancers Union. These events are focused around community building, education, and networking for freelancers of all industries. Right now, we're in about eight cities across the U.S. and looking to build um, more. So, if you're interested in, let me just add this up. If you're interested in bringing Spark to your city, email me at vchan at freelancersunion.org with the subject line local spark and I'll get back to you with more details about how to become a spark leader and start a meetup in your local area. Cool. I'll take it back to you, Jalen. Cool. Thank you so much. So definitely join, um, join us at our local spark events. If you have a local chapter and we're always happy to just pretty much find members, um, looking to get involved in the community. Uh, we're always powerful, more, more powerful together with everything that we do as freelancers. Um, so we're very happy to uh, have Veronica with us uh, leading that cohort and uh, leading us in the right direction. So uh, enough about that for now, but let's get on while you while you guys are here. We're here to talk about taxes. Um, taxes can be something very scary. It's overwhelming, but hopefully by the end of today, you'll feel a little bit less anxious. Uh, so here today to help us is Mr. Jonathan Meadows. Jonathan is the managing member of Meadows CPA. He received his bachelor's of science magna cum laude in economics and accounting and his MBA in finance from the Stern School of Business in New York University. He's a certified public accountant in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. He's also been featured as an expert CPA in the New York Post, Bloom Bloomberg Business Week, Accounting Today, Forbes Taxation Blog, and course here at Freelancers Union. He contributes to our blog very regularly. He's our go-to person if we have questions about, hey, what's going on with this year's taxes? He is our first response on the line. Um, so we're very happy to have him here with us. Let me bring him on. How are you, Jonathan? Good evening, Jalen. Good evening, Veronica. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It's always a pleasure. And the thing that I'm most proud of aside from working with our clients is being able to work with freelancers. That's my passion in life. That's my core business activity. I'm a freelancer myself, may have a couple of people working for me, but I have the same stresses. I have the same anxieties, it's challenging to keep the lights on. So I'm going to help you to hopefully mitigate a little bit of your tax bill so we can buy a couple more light bulbs and to make sure that we're in compliance with things so that we, no one bothers us. So we are going to talk about tonight about taxes. As everyone knows, next slide, Jalen. Hang on, guys. We're going to talk about tax season, general information, some specific deductions for freelancers, and some unique issues for 2024. There's the Corporate Transparency Act, which is something that a lot of us will have to comply with, and I'll get into details. And the new the American Families and Workers Act of 2024, which is a bill that's actually still pending in Congress. I would have hoped that by now it would have been signed, but unfortunately, um, this nation is such that we really don't have adults working together properly. And finally, cryptocurrency. The government is still heavily um, after cryptocurrency. So Jalen, would you please advance the slide to the next uh, theme? So our tax filing season is underway. Two major deadlines for your individual tax returns. That's 1040. And that should be 
everyone who's listening here, we are going to be, we have an April 15th tax filing deadline, unless you're in an area where there are some disaster declarations. Unfortunately, there have been some weather related storms and you know who you are. And in that case, you may want to check that there may be extended deadline to the IRS. And if you file a separate business tax return, an S corporation or a multi-member LLC, those are due March 15th. And on the chance that you file a C corporate tax returns, not that many in the room, that's also will be due by April 15th. All right. So Jalen, if you can advance to the next slide, please. So the first thing to, that you need to do in order to file your tax is to make sure that you have all your paperwork in front of you. Make sure you have your W-2s. Make sure you have your 1099s. Make sure you have your investment documents. I know a lot of us are still waiting on that. Organize your estimated tax payments. And here's a little pro tip. Some payments that you may have made in 2023 may not be for 23 taxes. For example, if you filed in April and owed money, even though that, that amount was paid in 23, that was for a 22 tax return. So when you list out your estimated tax payments, make sure that indeed the payments that you're listing were, were made for 2023. Uh, sometimes I know in our practice some clients give us data and they make a mistake and then you unfortunately you'll get a letter from the government and a little bit of interest. It's an unpleasant situation. So in addition to that, you want to organize your expenses as well, which we'll touch on. Next slide, please. So, but before we get to the expenses, we should talk about revenue. If you're a cash basis taxpayer, which is the default for a lot of us, you recognize the revenue in the year you get paid. This is a big issue for freelancers. So for example, you did a job in 2022, but you got paid in 2023. It's a 2023 tax event and should be reported in 23. So make sure that the 1099s that you're reporting match the revenue that you have in your books. And if there is a mistake, you may need to adjust your records or go back to the people that gave you 1099s. As an aside, a big issue that a lot of our freelancers have when I work with them is that they will complain that the 1099 that they receive is higher than what they got paid because a lot of those 1099s reflect expense reimbursements for example you had a job and you had to rent a car for a day that should be in the 1099 that you receive from the person that you were working with however that can be deductible on your tax returns on your business revenue and expenses Jalen, next slide document all income and deductions i get ask all the time, what do I need to report? And my answer is, if you made income, that needs to be reported, regardless of whether you receive a 1099 or not, you should be reporting that income. In addition, best practices are to have receipts for any deductions that you have. You do not need to submit those expense receipts with your tax returns, but in case of an audit, you will be asked to supply this. And as an aside, credit card statements by themselves are insufficient. So for example, if you went to Amazon and bought $1,000 worth of supplies over the year, the best practice would be to save those individual receipts from Amazon because the IRS will ask you to see those details. They want to make sure that if you spent, say that you bought office supplies, that indeed it's paper, pens, and consumables, and it's not personal groceries. Next slide, please. So there's some key deductions that especially that are pertinent to us freelancers. Number one is a home office deduction, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Business meals. They've been reset to 50%, meaning that if you have a business meal that you're meeting with a client or a potential client, if it costs $100, you enter $100 on your tax return and 50% will be deductible. Business travel expenses, I know a lot of us travel overnight. Lodging and transportation and parking are deductible. Health insurance. 
So health insurance is not deductible technically as a business expense. It's an adjustment to income, but there are some, there are some qualifiers to that. But top level, it's deductible for income tax purposes, but, but not for self-employment purposes. For those people that are starting up a business, and there's some caveats when this applies and when this doesn't. If you're pre-revenue, top level, you can take $5,000 in startup costs and an additional $5,000 in legal and formation costs. It's the lower of $5,000 or your actual expenses. So please keep that in mind. And mileage, standard mileage has gone up by a half a cent, um, two and a half cents, excuse me, to 67 cents per mile. Jalen? Some other deductions, rent. If you have a freestanding space, for example, I have an office. So that's 100% deductible. Utilities, interest and business debt, salaries paid to third parties, wages, legal and professional fees. And we'll touch on this in a little bit, but also you can make retirement plan contributions that's predicated on your income that will reduce your tax liability. Next slide, please. Okay, so a lot of freelancers do not have sufficient savings for retirement, but there's some tools that can that, that we can do to help ourselves. So if you have modest income, your goal should first be to try to put $6,500 into an IRA or into a Roth IRA. There's some pros and cons to both. If you're making more money and you can afford to do so, try to save money into a SEP IRA. The amount that you can put into a SEP IRA or to a solo 401k is predicated on your profit. So you can't just put in $66,000. It's 25%. There's certain rules, but for SEP IRAs, very top level, it's 25% of your profit. So in order to do $66,000, you need roughly $364,000 of profit. So I always tell clients that when they're filing your tax returns, please ask us your max SEP IRA because it's a function of your business profit. So if you have a year that you have lower profitability, the amount of money that you can put into a SEP IRA or to a solo 401k would go down because it's a function of your profit. And these numbers tend to adjust up each year based upon inflation. And for 2024, your max contribution is $69,000. The 2023, you can, fund, you can fund this up until April 15th. And if you take an extension, you have until October 15th to fund your 23 SEP IRA. The IRA, though, is due and Roth IRA are both due by April 15th. There's no extension on that. Jayla? Okay, so I, I get asked sometimes the difference between SEP IRAs and solo 401ks. They both converge to the maximum amount of $66,000, but for people that are in more modest income, the solo 401k will allow you to save much more money quickly, and I'll tell you why. You can, unlike the SEP IRA, which is the strict 25% of your profit, the solo 401k allows you to put in $22,500 as the equivalent of an employee, plus an additional 25% of your profit. So on more modest levels of income, you can stock away a lot more money for retirement quicker than on a SEP IRA. But again, there are caveats about what you can contribute for the $22,500 and the 25% is all predicated on your profit. And that number should go up to $23,000 uh, $23, going forward. And then there's a catch up as well. So the maximum amount of your set, if you're over 50 is actually 30,000 and 30,500 in 2024. Next slide, please. Okay, 1099 write-offs. So I touched upon some briefly, but here are some more. If you hire a contractor or a freelancer, for example, you pay an accountant, you pay a lawyer, you pay a web designer, you can deduct the entire cost. Please make sure that you issue a 1099. If you haven't, please do so. Technically, the deadline was January 31st, but you can still file it now. 
it comes up in case of audits. I've had audits where I've represented clients where they've had contract labor expenses and the IRS has made this a sticking point where they won't allow the deduction because the 1099 NEC was not filed. So if you haven't done so, I would cure it immediately. Separate and apart from issuing 1099s is our 1099 case. What that is, is that you may have seen in the news that the government's really trying to crack down on people not reporting income. And they're mandating that third party electronic payers such as Zelle, Venmo issue 1099 Ks for payments. The threshold for 2023 is 200 business transactions per year or $20,000. But even if you do not hit this threshold, please you still need to report payments from Venmo if it was for, for, for services for a profit, for an exchange for, for making money. Next slide. Business gifts. I'm constantly asked, hey, I want to give a gift to a client. Can I write it off? The answer is yes, but it's only $25 per person. And promotional items of your company's name, such as a pen, keychain, calendars, I give out all this stuff. Uh, don't count toward this limit if they cost $4 or less. So if you want to give gifts, you can, but unfortunately, it can't be anything exorbitant. Next slide. Auto deductions. A lot of, lot of people, especially outside of New York City, use their cars for work. Top level, there's two types of vehicles. You have some people, a lot of the trades, camera people also, well, they'll use a car exclusively 100% for business use. That's 100% deductible. Any costs are also deductible. So if you have a pickup truck that you're a landscaper and you're using for business, it's 100% deductible. The insurance is 100% deductible. The repair is 100% deductible. But for a lot of us, it's really a mixture. For example, I may drive to visit a client. I'm only allowed to take either a standard allowance for, for miles driven to a client or the percentage of the car use that I use for business. So if I use a car 10% for business use and 90% personal, I'm only allowed to write off 10% of the insurance, 10% of the maintenance, 10% of the car payments. You're also required to keep a log because in case of audit, the IRS will want to see this. Next slide. Okay. Business taxes are deductible. For example, I'm in New York City. If your profit's over $100,000 roughly, there's a New York City unincorporated business tax. That would be a deductible tax. Other states have various business license taxes or franchise taxes. Those would be deductible. If you pay sales tax for business purchases, that's added onto the cost. You spent thousand dollars on a computer and you have a 9% sales tax. That's another $90. That's also deductible as well. And if you hire people and they're on payroll, for example, you have your payroll. All the employer costs, such as Social Security, Medicare, unemployment, workers' comp, those are also deductible costs. Next slide. Okay. Now I'm going to get to some new things that are on the books for 2024. This is actually very, very important. Corporate Transparency Act. Corporate Transparency Act applies to every single company in the United States. C Corp, S Corp, single member LLC, multi-member LLC, anything that was incorporated at the, at the state level or in an Indian tribe is required to file this. What is it? The government's creating a, a national database of, of entities and you're required to report the ownership of your entity to the United, to the United States government prior to 12-31-2024, if your entity was created prior to 2024. For new businesses created in 2024, you have 90 days from when an entity is created to comply with this act. And in January and in 2025, that will go down to, 30, to 25 days. Bottom line, the government wants to know 
who's owning entities in the United States for because anti-money laundering purposes, tax collection purposes. I believe this information will be shared eventually with states. I suspect eventually it'll be shared with attorneys. I know certain states are considering doing this. New York passed the legislation prior to just around Christmas time, mandating a New York state version of that, although the details aren't out yet. So this is something that's definitely on your radar. You can't hide from this. If you don't do this, there are some nasty draconian penalties for not doing so. Next slide, please. Okay, this is this is an act that's separate and apart from tax filings. So it's not a tax filing. It's a separate file. It's filed on the U.S. Treasury's website. There's a separate uh, filing section, and it applies to everyone that 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 owns a company. Essentially, next slide, please. It's it's going. What the government wants to know is who owns a corporation. What are they? What they want to know specifically are own, people that own 25% or more of the entity, and or exercise a substantial control over an entity. Senior officers, who signs checks, who enters contracts, anyone who exercises influence or control over the entity, you need to report separate and apart from the 25%. I I, I expect to see a lot of enforcement on this in the years ahead. So I strongly encourage everyone. To, to, to do this right now. Next slide, please. Hypothetically, there's a $500 a day fine for not being compliant with this. And theoretically, this is also a criminal act that's a punishable up to two years in prison. So I would not take this lightly. Okay. The next issue is cryptocurrency reporting. This has been an extremely hot topic. I alluded to it at the beginning of my presentation. Prior to 2023 tax filings, there was a question on Form 1040 series asking if you own cryptocurrency. This has also been extended to business tax filings and trust and uh, trust filings. 1041, 1065, 1120, 1120 S. You need to you need to check off that you have it. If you own crypto, just check the box that you have it. If you sold it, if you bought or sold it, you need, if, excuse me, if you sold the asset, you need to report it similar to a tax transaction. Next, next slide. Okay. Finally, the American Family and Workers Act of 2024. This is still pending. This is what's going on in Congress right now. So these are all potential changes, but nothing has been passed into law yet. One advantage is, is that for 1099s, they will change the filing threshold from a thousand, from six hundred dollars to a thousand dollars going forward. Meaning that if, if, if you, if you um, paid someone six hundred dollars or more, you need to file tax. You need to file a 1099 in 2023. And that will be a thousand dollars in 2024, and that should be adjusted for inflation afterwards. You'll need to unknown. Next, next slide. Okay, employer retention tax credits. This is this is an area of major fraud going on. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard these commercials ad nauseum. The government estimates that over one of two. I think the statistics are even higher. Uh, people that file these employer retention credits may have been fraudulent. So in this vein, the government is shutting down the applications. So if someone had employees and felt that they were eligible for the employer retention credit, I strongly urge you to submit this within the next week or so. In mid-January, there was legislation that was going to shut this down by January 31st. Again, the legislation hasn't been passed, so it isn't terminated yet, but it will be imminently. So if you had employees and you feel that you were eligible for the uh, the employee retention tax credit, please file it right away. But the IRS has a web, has a quick compliance check on its website at irs.gov to see that if you're eligible. So before you do so, please make sure that you're eligible to claim this, to, to claim this credit. Not everyone is. It has a series of questions. That's an IRS.gov. And again, this is designed for people that had employees 
during the pandemic. Next slide. A couple of other changes that will increase the threshold for which you can write off longer term equipment right away. For example, if you bought a, let's see, what would be expensive equipment? If you bought like um, cameras that can cost ten or $20,000, theoretically, you can either amateur and depreciate them over several, several years or because of 179 deductions, you can write that off right away. The 179 deduction is designed for long-term assets such as machinery, equipment, computers, and appliances and furniture to be depreciated right away, and that threshold will go up. Next slide. And with that, get to the real part of the presentation of the questions, which I know a lot of people like to ask questions, and I'm more than happy to help. And Jalen, you, you lead, or Veronica, you lead, and I'll answer. Sure. Um, all right. So we're going to go with questions first from um, the sign up form for this event where people got to submit their own question. Um, we aren't asking every single question from this form, just since a lot of them were covered throughout the presentation. Um, but let's start with let's start with this one, which scares a lot of people. What flags an audit? So. Suspected fraud, the IRS has. They have computer systems that they'll look at, let's say Schedule C, and they'll compare the revenue and certain expenses. If they're out of whack, you may get an audit. Same thing for the states. Actually, the states tend to be more aggressive than the IRS. On the New York side, I've seen people that have had substantial losses on their taxes, legitimate losses. For example, someone that invested in an inventory had a client that invested $90,000 in inventory and had $30,000 loss, automatically got an audit letter. Areas that tend to, in the past, that have triggered audits, losses, losses for multiple years, abuses of travel, meals, auto. Those tend to do those tend to do things. The best thing to do is to issue 1099s, especially when you have contract labor, because that gives you coverage. Meaning that if you have you paid someone hundred, two hundred thousand dollars as freelancers, if you issue the 1099s. No one will bother you because the government got 1099s. But if you don't and you have that, that's also another red flag. So bottom line, running an unprofitable business or running a business where expenses are prone to be abused are areas where you're potentially opening up a door for an audit. And then sometimes it's just random. Your SOL, it just happens. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and that kind of it's actually a good lead to this next question that someone submitted is what happens when my deductions are more than my reported income. I, can I, I'm going to reframe this question a little okay. bit because I, I think uh, this, we're, I presume we're talking about business expenses here, just for this, because deductions can be Schedule A. So I'm going to reframe this in the light of what happens when my business expenses are more than my business revenue. So what happens is let's assume you lost thirty thousand dollars. That means you have a loss. It will then go to ten forty. It will reduce other taxable income that you have, and that will reduce your tax bill. So if you made, if you had a thirty thousand dollar loss on your Schedule C, but you had a W two for fifty thousand dollars, you had another, you had a side job, your tax taxable income before your standard itemized deductions will be twenty thousand dollars. Then you go to me. What happens if I'm doing this full time and I just lose a bunch of money? It does happen. Then there's certain calculations, but bottom line, you may be able to carry loss. The flow, may be able to carry the loss forward to future years. Got it. And and that you just have to pay uh, across like installments for the next few years, or no, 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 reduce your taxable oh. income for future years. But there's some gotcha. caveats that take out the standard deductions. There's some caveats of what gets carried forward. But again, yeah. if you have big losses, please make sure that you have expenses. To going back to my presentation, because it's an auto flag. So just make sure that you're papered up, make sure they're all legit. If it's if it's true, it's true. It may be a little bit unpleasant, but if you're entitled to it, there's nothing wrong with it. Cool. Uh, we just put up a ticker at the very bottom. You can check out more resources. The link is also on the YouTube page as well for our tax center. We have various different blog posts and resources, some by Jonathan himself, uh, for our members that they can read up more about some of these. Jalen, are we blogs. posting the slide? Are we gonna post um, I don't think so, but the whole stream itself will exist on our youtube page for people awesome. to just refer Great. back so they'll have access to that um, pretty much until we decide to take it down 
Um, but yeah, definitely check out that link if you haven't already. Um, I'm looking for the next question. Um, this is a question that I feel like I personally get asked a lot from our members is how do I estimate and pay self-employment taxes or how do I estimate how much to save even? Let me answer the second question first. So a good rule of thumb for my, that I tell my clients is 30 to 33%. So the, the more deep question is you need to project out your profit and calculate your effective tax rates. In fact, cap rate your self-employment tax and you pay that to the federal government and do the same exercise for state and local taxes. I tend to tell clients to save uh, like a 30% to 33% based upon their profit after expenses. And then you can pay the IRS at irs.gov. There's a way to pay your estimated taxes there. You can Google, how do I make a tax payment? And there's an option. And then the states have the equivalent option as well. Now, one thing, because we're in New York City, I know you're in Brooklyn, if I believe I'm in Manhattan right now. New York State is one of the few, especially in New York City, if you're a resident of New York City, in addition to New York State taxes, there's a New York City tax. There's actually two New York City taxes that are pertinent to freelancers. There's a New York City income tax, which New York State collects on behalf of New York City. If you look at a New York State tax return, you will see that as another line item and also for Yonkers. So if you're a resident of New York City, your personal income taxes are part of your state payment. And if your profit's roughly approximately $100,000 or more, there's a New York City business tax, unincorporated business tax of 4%. I'm talking about now for freelancers, people that aren't entities. And that's directly paid to the New York City Department of Finance. So you also need to know who you owe money to and make sure you pay them appropriately. Got it. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see what the next question is going to B. Um, let's go with this question. Um, who is exempt from having to pay seasonal taxes or is anyone exempt to pay seasonal taxes? Well, it depends. Bottom line, if you're making money, you should be paying estimated taxes because otherwise you may get penalties later on. And more importantly, you may not have income. You may not have the money to pay them. What I find, where I find out a lot of freelancers have a problem is that they make money they don't pay the estimated taxes they use that cash flow to pay their bills it comes april 15th they don't have the money to pay gotcha. so i encourage people to get into regular habits of that yeah and it goes back to how much you should set aside to save for that 30 to 33 mm -hmm. percent so mm -hmm. cool um all right let's now there's a whole one one more step in. there's a whole yeah, rule yeah. about calculations for estimated taxes. I encourage you to read up on it. But bottom line, there are also safe harbor provisions. So even if you pay enough in estimated taxes, so you don't have a penalty for not paying because the government will give you a penalty if you don't pay enough estimated taxes because the government wants its cash flow. Even if you don't get the penalty, you may still get yourself into trouble by not being able to pay the tax bill by April 15th. And an extension will give you an ex time, extra time to file but if you owe money after April April 15th, interest and a small penalty still runs as well. The extension mitigates a much bigger penalty of 5% per month on top of the interest. Gotcha. Interesting. All right. Um, we're going to go to the next question that someone submitted. Um, I've seen advertisements for back tax forgiveness programs from the IRS. Are they scams or do these programs actually exist? A little bit of both. So I think what you're talking about, these these, these advertisements where they say we'll settle for pennies on the dollars, which is typically something called an offer and compromise. And that's usually predicated on people that owe a major amount of income, major amount of taxes, and they don't have the income. Bottom line, in order to really f pay the IRS less than what you owe them, you have to demonstrate an inability to pay this. It's usually a function of income. A sob story doesn't work. The IRS will give you a payment plan. Interest will still run on that. So I would be very leery of responding to those commercials on air. I go to an attorney. I go to a CPA that's reputable. Ask the freelancers union. Ask other professionals. I've had some success doing offers and compromises for people. But I was usually in a situation where I had one client, unfortunately, passed away. He owed $300,000 in taxes and he 
he was making ten thousand dollars. He was just he was destitute at that point. Damn. Oh, all right. Um, let's go to the next question here. It is. If I'm a sole proprietor, at what point should I consider becoming an LLC? And are there specific tax benefits or drawbacks, I guess, making that decision? So would it be like at an income threshold? Not point? a simple yes and no answer. So let me expand this to LLC, S corporation, C corporation. You really have to understand not only the federal taxes, but state and local taxes because New York City, for example, has separate business taxes that come into place. And there are different taxes for sole proprietors slash single member LLCs, LLCs, taxes, partnerships, LLCs, taxes, S corporations. I'm sorry. Yeah, LLCs, taxes, S corporations, S corporations, C corporations. So the devil's in the detail, but very, very top level. A sole proprietor and a single member LLC are taxed exactly the same. It's a disregarded entity. They are both on your tax return. So you're going to be, why would I become an LLC? Well, there are reasons that people will become an entity aside from taxes. Limited liability protection, branding. So if you're asking me strictly from a tax perspective, sole proprietor or LLC, I'll tell you I'm indifferent. But I'll also tell you to understand your risks. I'll tell you to speak to an attorney to see if it makes sense. To, to form an LLC. Cool. I think that's pretty good advice. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, like, it's not just the tax purpose, especially for the LLC. It is just the liability aspect. And there's a lot there. It's a multi multifaceted conversation. It can also be branded. I know for myself, when did I decide to form a PLLC? Because I'm a registered, I'm a professional entity and I have to be regulated by state education department. I started having people working for me. That was the impetus for myself. I was beyond me. I started having a couple of people working with us and it was a brand that was, that was my, that was my impetus to set up our, our entity. Got it. But yeah, we always try to advise members if they own any like actual like assets, like either like a house or anything like that, you should probably incorporate as an LLC. Just uh, what you should do is that. really speak to an attorney and don't do things. Uh, my, my suggestion is speak to the proper professional. And also, I would say the following. If your primary reason to form an entity is to mitigate exposure in case of lawsuits, someone's going to get you. They'll always get you. Yeah. Make sure you have the appropriate insurance, uh, errors and omissions insurance, i.e. malpractice insurance or the equivalent of it. That's the best defense to avoid issues. But absolutely, I'm not mitigating having the entities. In, it has its place. But the main piece of that also is making sure you have the appropriate insurances. Always got to be protected. Um, all right, let's go to the next question. I know you covered a little bit uh, about the contributions, but for the SEP, aside from that, the SEP IRA versus the solo 401k, are there diff other pros and cons? When this is all like, you like coffee or, or chocolate. So there's some pros and cons <laughs> for both. Look, if you're making a hundred thousand dollar profit, very top level, the 401k will allow you to sock away more money. So if you only have, so if you can't do the extra twenty three thousand dollars, on top of the twenty five percent, I'd say do a SEP IRA. Why? Because once you have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more in assets in a solo 401k, you need to start filing separate fifty five hundred tax returns. So there's additional compliance that you need to do. Bottom line, I recommend the solo 401k if you're able to stop away more money. This is meant for people that like, say 50 or 100, $100, $200,000. They want to put more money away than they can in a SEP IRA, go for the 401k. Disadvantage, extra compliance once the assets hit 250000 or more. And of course, there are friendly penalties always around if you don't do it. The problem, guys, is that the more you make things complex, very top level is the more you can mess up and cause bigger problems for yourself. With an S corporation, let me just go in that vein for a second, if you don't mind. People are like, I want to be an S corporation. Well, okay, great. Run, do you, are you running the payroll? What? I have to run payroll? Yeah, that's a requirement. If you don't do so, you can be fine. So let's say you sign up for payroll. You miss a quarter, you get a fine. You don't sign up for the appropriate insurances at the state and local level, you get fined. 
So the more complex you make things, the more risk you have of not being compliant and resulting penalties. So I always tell clients also, hey, are you the type of person that's on top of things? Because if you are, and even if you're going to save some money in taxes, the potential issues it can cause of this isn't worth it. Yeah, that's a good point. Hmm. You just, it's, it's everything. It's a system. Look, I go to my doctor, I'll ask for medication and he'll be like, look, you know, there's a, there's a risk reward trade off. It's the same thing here. There's no one slam answer. It all has potential benefits, but burdens and costs. The more complex you make something, the more it's going to cost you to run it. Yeah. That's actually, that should be on a t-shirt if anything. Kit, uh, <laughs> Tip O'Neill. Kiss, keep it simple, stupid. He was a house speaker in the 80s. I remember reading his biography. <laughs> cool. Um, we're going to look, I'm going to look at some of the questions coming in from the live chat mm -hmm. now that I think are really good. So where was it? Um, there was one question I just saw. Ooh, where, where did it go? It was about, um, oh, here it is. So the question is, what does complying with the CTA entail? Where do we register our companies to comply? Okay, so the CTA is regulated by United States Tre United States Department of Treasury. Google it. And you'll find you'll find a website there, and you can do so. What's involved is very top level entering your company information where it was formed, and then entering the owner information. I believe you also need to upload certain documents to them as well. Gotcha. All right, cool. So just check out uh, the Treasury, United States Treasury. Uh, Google you CTA, United States Treasury. Treasury. It's awesome. tedious. It isn't that complicated. It's tedious. And if you can't do it, get a professional to help you. Cool. Um, all right, we're going to go to the next question. Uh, in terms of deductions, I'd like to hear a little bit more about giveaways. If it isn't a certain amount, is can, can it be considered a gift or will it be more considered as a promotional? It has to be $4 or left. Bottom line is designed for keychains, magnets, pens, coasters. If someone wants one, I'm happy to send them. It's meant for low end stuff. It's not meant for fancy stuff. Gotcha. All right, cool. I didn't know that. Huh. I just learned something new. Um, all right, let me see. If you see. want a coaster, Jalen, let me know. I'll send you one. <laughs> I think we should get some coasters too. Exactly. Um, Very nice. They're about a dollar fifty dollar, dollar fifty a piece. That's the doctor was under the four dollar threshold. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to the next question. Um, I like the graphics, by the way. Definite improvement of things. The thank you. Pictures of the people popping up, asking the question. Really, I mean, whoever is working with you guys, are really stepped up your game. <laughs> This is just all on StreamYard that we've been trying to upgrade some of our streams with. So. I'm very impressed with it. Very, very. A little, little bit nicer than just standard Zoom. I'm a visual guy. I can't do it. You know, I'm not an artist. I know a lot. We have some marketing graphic types. I don't have the aesthetic eye. I, I try to always have at least one person on our team that does it. I, but I appreciate it. And very much I see the difference. All right, cool. So we're going to just... I uh, have a few more questions because I know you're a very busy man. Um, next question is going. Next question is going to be: I established my LLC last year, but received payment as a sole proprietor. Can I deduct the 5K startup this year instead of last? Let me give me one second. You deduct in the year that you incur the expenses. Okay. Cool. Simple enough. Simple enough. Um, Oh, okay. There's a couple of new questions popping in. I don't know specifically what this is about. If this is more for foreign taxes. Let me see. Maybe I can answer it. Maybe I can. So it's, what do you think of applying for IRS certificate 6166 by filing out form 8802? Yes, you need to consult professionals out of the scope. Okay. Of no problem. Um, all right. Let me see a couple other questions. Shh. Um, someone asked about Googling CTA for Treasury. It comes with classifi classification, transactions, and accountability CTA. Um, look up Corporate Transparency Act. Um, Corporate Transparency Act. And you should find it there. Um, yes. Next question is, if I'm a student in- By the way, let me just add one thing yeah. about the Corporate sure. Transparency Act. It doesn't apply to nonprofits. It doesn't apply to just like general generic partnerships. 
i.e. it's formed at the state or, or county level or, or the Indian government, but it doesn't apply to nonprofits. It's for for-profit entities. Gotcha. All right. Go ahead. Um, what was that question? So the question is, do I need to issue 1099s if, if I made payments to contractors were made as a student towards a degree requirement and not a business entity? Do I need to issue as a payment? So I'm going to rephrase this because I think I can answer this question. If you paid NYU tuition, you don't need to issue them a 1099. So I hope that answers your question. If the person of uh, uh, Mat Matisson, Madison, sorry, <laughs> I can't even read. Well, Madison, if you like to like, rephrase I'm the question, point. feel free. Please. <laughs> no problem. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the hard and fast questions that we have from our members. Um, yeah, any, I'm trying to think, do you have any last minute words of wisdom uh, for any? Yeah, members? I do, I do actually, if I may. Please do. What I've seen, I'm gonna tell you what I've seen increase in audits, I know this is always a sensitivity. There's two things that I've seen. Number one, mismatch. Very simply put, you report something on your tax return and you miss something. You miss a W-2. You miss a brokerage statement. It happens. There, nothing's mailed to you anymore. You'll get a letter saying, hey, you didn't file something. Here's a bill. Here's interest and penalties. So please understand the universe of who needs to pay you. And if you didn't get something, don't file your tax returns until you get it. So that's number one, especially for our 1099 friends here, make sure that the revenue that you're reporting in your tax returns is at least equal to the 1099s that were filed with the IRS and probably more because not everyone's going to issue a 1099. Number two, be very careful if you have losses, especially at the state level. I know New York State invested a ton of money and these things are automatic audits now that I mentioned before where they're auditing people if they have losses. Don't embellish things. If, especially if you have losses, assume someone's going to ask a question and be prepared to have the documents. And again, the credit card statements are insufficient. You need the original receipts. Amazon, Walmart. I, I buy a lot of stuff from Amazon and Walmart for our office. I have a few people working with us and I'm nice. I buy coffee and stuff. We have receipts for everything. Paper, just make sure you have all this stuff. Digital, hard copy, something that where you can get access in a couple of years because sometimes these things do not come up in a month of filing they may come up six months later a year later two years later and the oh my hard drive crash excuse doesn't work anymore people won't accept it yeah how often do you find that people that like the irs like always just ask for receipts or like i find it more the states now i find new york state's getting very aggressive in the audits okay i, I mean ours i do have audits don't get me wrong but new york state is just the states have their act together a little bit more than irs the irs is investing resources their the rit has been they were underfunded and they've gotten more funding so i expect them to step up their game as well and be very leery especially if you take any tax credits that's another area that's prone to abuse and the government will scrutinize and will ask you to prove it gotcha huh. something to think about oh well, cool uh, i think that's great final words of wisdom for all of our members and hopefully Hopefully it's a little bit less intimidating for our members for filing taxes this year, um, but we will have more tax events and more tax resources here at Freelancers Union. I just wanna thank you, Jonathan, for taking time of your day to help all of our members. And you can reach out to Jonathan if you'd like at meadowcpa.com. Uh, we can put the link in the chat and the description down below as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, it was great seeing you, Jonathan. Hope you have a wonderful day. And we'll definitely send some of our members your way as well, as we always do in case they need help or specific questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to, pre uh, sorry, taking time of your day to sit with us for this tax events for our first one of the year. Um, like I said, we're gonna have a couple more here at Freelancers Union Freelancers Hub. Um, definitely check out all of our other resources at freelancersunion.org. And we also have our tax center resource page. If you need to read up anything, feel free. Uh, this recording will sit on our YouTube page, as I mentioned before. So if you do have to, uh, or if you would like to rewatch the events again, to just give a light recap on everything, feel free to do so. And definitely subscribe 
to our channel, like this video, and subscribe to our newsletter for all of our updates, upcoming events, whether they're virtual or in person, and just any other news that you may see, whether if it's laws that we're trying to pass for freelancers and free in specific states or cities, spark events, whatever it may be. Um, stay tuned for us, and we hope to see you again next time. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Take care.